It's Subverted Tropes, a podcast about movies, featuring your hosts, Daniel Spencer and Kate Harlow. Welcome to another episode of Subverted Tropes. I am Kate. I'm Dan. Today we're going to be talking about the 1978 Invasion of the Body Snatchers. This is one that I have not seen before. Uh, that's going to be the case with much, much many of the the episodes this coming uh, month. We are we are going over a lot of ones that Dan hasn't seen purely so that we can get them crossed off of the list. Exactly. I mean, that's the whole reason I started doing my October movie marathon was to fill in a lot of those gaps. So this is one of them that needs to be filled in. Uh, you ready to jump in? Let's do it. So, the original Invasion of the Body Snatchers came out in 1956 and was widely well-received. It was actually seen by a lot of people as a political statement, warning about the dangers of McCarthyism. Ooh. And it was actually deemed originally too dark because the ending had... Because I've seen... I haven't seen all of the original. Mm-hmm. I've seen the last probably about 20 minutes. Okay. The ending has the main character, as played by Kevin McCarthy, uh, just yelling at cars passing by that have, like, there are truckloads and truckloads of the, the pods that these pod people are coming in. Mm-hmm. And he's yelling, they're coming for you. You're going to be next. And he's yelling that, looking right at the camera. Yes. So that was determined to be too dark and too startling mm-hmm. for for audiences in the 50s. Yes. So they shot some additional footage of him being taken to a, a like a shrink and shrink saying, OK, well, this guy's crazy. It was a psychiatrist at a hospital, but the, the, he's saying, OK, well, this guy's just not mentally stable. And then a truck driver comes in and he's carrying these pods and then they call in the FBI right. and everything's going to be okay. Right. So that's where they, they left off that one. So in 1978, mm-hmm. director Philip Kaufman felt that he could do an updated, better version Ooh, that's of the movie. That's not normally a good idea. It isn't. But from everything I understand, it is better. I wasn't able to find a whole lot of information out there on the interwebs about the production of the movie or or things like that like we normally do with they were going to cast this person or here's a fun production secret. Right. I do have a few things that are going to be pretty fun, but not as many as I usually do. So this might be a little bit of a shorter pod cast. Nope. Pod. Nope. Cast? Nope. Podcast? Okay. The usual. <laughs> Pod? No. Cast? Nope. Podcast? Just get to the facts. Okay, so the biggest part of the movie, in my opinion, just based off what I read, mm-hmm. this movie is used a lot in film school mm-hmm. uh, for one particular aspect of it. Would you like to guess what aspect that is? No. Sound design. <laughs> <laughs> the sound design of this movie is fantastic. Yes. And is used, like I said, as an example in film schools mm-hmm. for this is how you freaking sound design. The sound designer, whose name is Ben Burt, mm-hmm. B-U-R-T-T. Of bees. Of Burt's bees. <laughs> uh, had just come up. He was hired right after a small movie that he worked on came out in 1977 that his sound effects work really impressed Mm -hmm. the producers. I'm trying to remember the name of the movie, something star Wars. Okay. Yeah. yeah, 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 Star Star, Star Wars. So, uh, he did the sound design for star Wars and obviously it was impressed a lot of people. Yeah. That's uh, that's a, a pretty not bad credit. Yeah. So they hired him on to do this. So awesome. There are a couple of points where we see some pods. Yes. And we hear heartbeats. Mm-hmm. We hear screaming. Mm-hmm. 
the heartbeat sound was actually taken from his at that time pregnant wife's ultrasound. Holy crap. So that's his child's heart beating. Man, that's some that's some nepotism, all right? That's just just shoehorning your children into the business. So <laughs> you say that and yet I have a feeling when we have kids that we're, we're going to do the exact same the thing to whatever that's business be, we're in. We're, hopefully podcast and all sorts of entertainment. I mean, yeah. So, <laughs> little little Montpelier. Help me. I don't know why you need help. Montpelier's going to do all the helping that you need. Guys, help me, please. Anyway, there's we hear the screaming that I mentioned. Is that also the baby? Uh, no, that was pig squeals. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That makes sense. Uh, you know what I think? We need some screaming, but we don't. Let's let's find an even creepier way to make that happen. Let's get the you see that pig over there. Let's tell it how chicken nuggets are made. Tell it how chicken nuggets are made and record its sounds. Beautiful. Tell it how bacon is made and record its. Uh, feed it bacon, then tell it what you just fed it, and record those screams. Side note, I was at uh, I was at the market today and found some really, really, really great prices on uncut bacon. So oh, really? Yes. Well, we, we may need, we'll need to do that. Yes. Continue. So he also recommended that they shift the sound effects throughout the course of the movie, the background sound effects. So instead of like the chirping birds and the, mm -hmm. you know, crickets and insects and stuff that you hear at the beginning of the movie. Mm hmm that slowly stops halfway through and turns into more mechanical sounds. You hear cars, you hear alarms, you hear a lot more synthetic sounds instead mm -hmm. of natural sounds mm -hmm. to try and get the viewer offset from feeling at ease. Interesting. I think that is brilliant. Yeah. I oh, love that approach. Yeah, that's absolutely it is a, a fascinating approach. So let's talk about Donald Sutherland. Let's. Donald Sutherland is a badass. Hell yeah, he is. The only criticism I have for Donald Sutherland. Yes. I've seen pictures from this movie. Is it his hair? It's that mustache. Oh. It's horrible. That was like that was really a trend though at the time. I know my dad had a mustache. So did mine. Uh, so did my uncle's. Actually, I a uh, couple. Uh, well, okay, maybe like five. But between five and ten years ago, I posted a a photo on the internet that was a, a collage I had assembled of my father and my uncles, and I, I titled it The Questionable Mustaches that is of fantastic. Our, their family. Um, because all of the photos are from around that era, they're, pr they're a little porn stashy. To be fair, by the time this movie came out, my dad would have been 14. <laughs> so he probably didn't have uh, that mustache at the time. Remind me again the year? Uh, 78. Okay. Yeah. No, my, my dad was at least 20... At least 22, I would say. Otherwise, uh, Donald Sutherland insisted on doing all of his own stunts, particularly in the climax of the movie. Mm -hmm. He's running around in a, a factory and having to do some impressive stunts. He insisted that he not have any harnesses or nets for safety purposes. That's, I mean, like, I'm a fan of, like, I appreciate an actor who's like, yeah, I want to, I want to get in it and do this, but like, he's still got to take some safety precautions. Let's, um, come on. That's true, but I think his safety precaution was looking into the mirror and realizing he's Donald Bucking Sutherland. There's a thing called hubris, and hubris can seriously fuck up a production schedule. I think we talked about that in our last episode, but that was nuclear hubris. Yeah, and it fucked up those ants. It did. So you're saying it can fuck up the filming. Yes. If Donald Sutherland gets hurt. Yes. Similarly, if you have bad extras, yeah. they could hurt Donald Sutherland. Yes. Like when they hit him with a car. That happened. Shit. In one scene where... So that's how he was able to cough up all that blood in the Hunger Games. Yep. That's exactly it. 
one scene he and Brooke Adams' character are running and he got hit with a car hard enough that he like rolled up onto the windshield and apparently was able to turn around just in time to see the extra who was driving it say, oh my God, not you. Oh my God. That's I just, great. I just would really love to, not him, then whom? <laughs> I'm sorry, I meant to hit someone else with the car. I was trying to hit Jeff Goldblum. Uh, Another actor who probably would be like, yeah, I'm badass enough to just fuck around with this. I can do it. Agreed. Yeah. But yeah, I just love that. Not you. Not you. Not you. Not the, oh my God, I'm sorry. Not the, oh my God, I'm going to get fired. Oh my God. Not you. That's, I mean, I think that's probably a reaction of like, Oh my god, I've severely screwed everything up. At least I hope I haven't screwed it. Oh no, no, I really screwed it up that bad. You know what it probably was? Hmm. The extra driving had probably played in like a cast and crew poker game they against ha- Donald Sutherland a week beforehand and owed him a lot of money but was able to successfully hide from him up until that point where then he hit Donald Sutherland and said, oh shit, now I've got to pay up on this $5,000 I owe Donald Sutherland. No, you know what? It probably was. There was probably a Deadpool going for the entirety of the cast and crew, and he probably bet against his best friend, who probably put Donald Donald Sutherland as... Oh, that's probably it. Well, I mean, it still went well, because Donald Sutherland didn't die. Yeah. But, I mean, he probably thought in that moment, oh, my God, my best friend, I just I just won this for my best friend, and he's going to lord it over me for the rest of my life. Oh, yeah, that's... Which will probably not be very long, because I'm going to get convicted of manslaughter right. with this car, and then I'm going to go to jail, and then I'm probably going to get shanked, because I'm not going to agree to be anybody's bitch. Yeah, I think that's all the stuff that instantly went through this driver's head. That's, that's everything that happens when I almost hit anybody with a car. <laughs> Let's talk about the cameos in this movie. Let's do. Uh, Kevin McCarthy, Mm -hmm. as previously mentioned, being the star of the first movie, he has a very quick cameo Mm -hmm. in in the 78 version. Mm -hmm. And while he was warming up for it, there was a homeless man who I guess had wandered onto the set. As they do. Naked. As they do. And he went up to Kevin McCarthy recognizing him and said, the original was better. Um, as they do. Not, can I have some money? Not, I you need know, some clothes. When when you're homeless and you have surrendered all of your clothing and you started just walking onto film sets, I don't think your goal is for money or clothing. I think you're really there with an agenda. To be a film critic. That homeless man went on to be Gene Shalit. Obviously. <laughs> That is not the case. Gene, <laughs> Gene Shalit, please, don't sue us. God damn it. The original director, Don Siegel, also has a cameo in this movie as a cab driver in San Francisco. Mm-hmm. He's supposed to pick up Donald Sutherland and Brooke Adams, and they're supposed to be nervous about the situation. And then he hits them with his cab. No, <laughs> but... It's very easy for them to be nervous because he insisted on actually driving around the streets of San Francisco without his glasses. Nope. nope. And he was very, very blind. Well, not actually blind, but he was very, his sight was very bad without his glasses. That's not great. So they were actually very legitimately and I would say understandably nervous. Rightfully so. Rightfully so. Robert Duvall has a cameo in this. Oh my goodness. He was in town filming another movie, and he had already been in a movie that Philip Kaufman had made prior. Mm -hmm. Philip was just like, hey, you want to come have a quick cameo in this movie that I'm shooting? And Robert Duvall said, sure. And Philip Kaufman was like, well, we should, I mean, we should pay you for this. And Robert Duvall was like, nah, don't worry about it. And Kaufman's like, no, we actually like need to give you some sort of restitution he's like okay i'll take an eddie bauer jacket i want that kind of life someday yeah that's like i want to be in a situation 
we're like, I'm doing so well that people are just like, hey, do you want to come do this? And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. That sounds fun. And we're like, no, 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 we have to. And I'm like, okay, okay, cool. Uh, you can pay me in coffee cake. Ooh, coffee cake. But also like jackets. I, I like, yeah. ja- I enjoy jackets. I would like a half dozen tiny ceramic elephants, one smaller than the next. Yes. I would like a pat on the back from your father. My father? No, not your father. I can get a pat on the back from your father. No, you can. But I'm saying, like, I I would want to say to the director, (laughs) excuse me, Catherine Bigelow, I will be happy to be in your movie, but please, can I just get approval from your father? That's all I crave in life. And the next and the last real cameo isn't really an on-screen cameo. Mm-hmm. It is a, it's an audio cameo, which is real fun to say, audio cameo. Audio cameo. We see a homeless man clothed. But do we hear him? We hear him playing the banjo. Who is playing that banjo? Jerry Garcia. Of course he is. Which I just, I just love that they're like, we need someone to play this banjo. Somebody call Jerry. Oh, Jerry, get Jerry on the phone. Jerry will do it. Jerry, can you put this on speaker? Put us on speaker. All right, Jerry, just just play well, some. Just play us some, out of tune. Yeah, just play some notes on the banjo. We need this for a scene in our movie. Sound, sounded kind of like you went off there, Jerry. Did you fall asleep again? Jerry, wake up. Wake up, Jerry. He's having a little ice cream nap, guys. A little ice cream nap for Jerry Garcia. <laughs> so, in terms of pay, Donald Sutherland made somewhere between two hundred and three hundred thousand dollars for this movie. Leonard Nimoy, Jeff Goldblum, and Brooke Adams... Remember, Brooke Adams has a nude scene in this movie. Each earned 25000 200 versus 25 That is correct. For nudity. Fuck that shit. We as a species have a long way to go. God damn, we do. <sighs> All right, well, uh, that's going to be it for now. I've got a little bit more information, but I'd like to bring that up once we've uh, seen the movie. So... Do it. You ready? Yeah. Let's watch this movie. All right, we are back. That's a... That's a really good movie. That's such a good movie. It's... It's a good one. I think I've mentioned this before. I have really broad pop culture knowledge and there are a lot of things that I know a lot about to the point where my knowledge is it blurs the line over whether or not I've actually seen something or if I just know a lot of facts about it and I don't remember if I've seen it or not. And that was one of those ones that I knew a lot about and I couldn't remember if I had seen it or not. Uh, and I, t- I hadn't actually seen it all the way through front to back before. Oh, okay. So uh, it's, but again, I, I know so many other references to it that it was, The way my brain works, I like to equate it to, like, a video game map, like, classic, like, Zelda or something, where, like, you reach a new area and a different part of the map lights up. That's how my brain works. So that's that's what it's like watching things for me sometimes. I think that is understandable. I'm the same way. I hadn't seen that before, but I knew about the last scene Mm -hmm. because it's, it's iconic. Yes. And a fun fact about that is that Only the director, the writer, and Donald Sutherland knew how that scene was going to play out. (laughs) No one else knew that he had been turned by the body snatchers. So, Uh, Spoiler. uh, Spoiler. (laughs) Um, For a a nearly 40-year-old movie. I'm just going to keep saying it, though. That's fine. Um, But yeah, no one knew that that was going to happen. So the look on Veronica Cartwright's face is, that is a completely legitimate reaction. Yes. And I love that. I love Mm -hmm. when directors do that. I think there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. And I I think there's a lot of 
it's being utilized by a lot more a lot more writers and a lot more directors and producers nowadays. Obviously, you could point to the entirety of the Harry Potter series uh, with J.K. Rowling and Alan Rickman, and then of course what's going on with uh, Game of Thrones. And I mean that hasn't even been completely and totally written, but George R. R. Martin has said what he intends to have happen. So you know, yeah. it yeah, it's just a very interesting tack to take, and I think it's great. Yeah, I I think it's a very very interesting tool. Let's talk a little bit about something you pointed out early on that you really enjoyed. The soundtrack. The soundtrack. More than just the the sound effects, which we already mentioned were fantastic. Fantastic. And um, I want to talk about what I think makes them so fantastic in a minute. But the soundtrack was written by jazz pianist Denny Zeitlin. And it is fantastic. It's really beautiful. The other films he has worked on have been such big names as... And he's never done anything since, never did anything before. Beautiful, beautiful work. He was work. just a jazz pianist. And... Hey, you, you want to make a movie? Uh, sure, Cat. that sounds great. Ow, Ripley. Oh, did Ripley just bite you? Yes. Associate producer Ripley has... This cat does not want to make a movie. <laughs> no, she does not. And that's fine. She wants to make a podcast. You can tune in to our uh, Twitter and uh, see some of the pictures of her editing our show. Hard at work. Uh, that podcast, by the way, is at Subverted Tropes. I think you mean that Twitter is at Subverted Tropes. Did I say podcast? You definitely did. I did. One of the things that in regards to the sound design for this movie, I think that one of the things that makes it so good is that it isn't, what you get from most movies, which is isolated sound with a little bit of background. Especially in the beginning when shit is hitting the fan. Mm -hmm. There are scenes with Jeff Goldblum and Donald Sutherland talking over each other. Yeah. And someone trying to get an important point across, but there's too much sound for anyone to really be able to hear it, including the listener. And that makes for, at least for me an extremely stressful situation. Like, my back muscles are hurting because I was so tense for the first part of that movie. Yeah, it's really... It's it's a, a full-body experience. It's very immersive, and that's not something that you always find. I think there are other, other movies, uh, particularly, I think, recently, that try to make that that effort but fail to do so. I think... I don't. I didn't see it in theaters, but uh, Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them, I think, was trying to have that that play with the sound and audio effects and the dialogue, and just didn't successfully pull it off, from what I understand. Yeah, I, I heard the same. Yeah, but um, I was very impressed with that. I was very impressed with the special effects, the visual effects. Yeah, they were beautiful, and particularly for that time period, all the way away back then. Uh, like well done without looking very cheesy and i i'm just a sucker for practical effects oh yeah me too i will go on a long rant we'll put that as one of our once we get a patreon up and going that'll be one of our supporters <laughs> things is they'll be able they'll maybe, have access maybe not use the word rant rant sounds negative they'll i have think access to a 30 minute podcast of us talking about why practical effects are just the best the awesomest so one of my favorite facts about this after the movie came out. In L.A., someone took the time to take a look at the pods from the movie, mm -hmm. make a whole bunch of them, oh. and scatter them around town. That's amazing. People got so freaked out, they called the police. That's fantastic. That's one of those things that like you couldn't get away with now, that kind of like viral marketing, because, I mean... As a society, people do that kind of thing, and they do it in a harmful, negative way, and it's not fun anymore. Yeah, I, I agree with that. It's like we see some viral marketing stuff. You might particularly like the uh, red balloons tied to sewer grates. Yes. That happened this year in the promotion for the remake of Stephen King's It. At, but at least uh, one one single latex balloon tied to a sewer grate uh, isn't something that people are going to think of as a potential explosive. Correct. Uh, but a like a paper mache pod, 
you don't know what could be in there. Right. Could, could be a body. Who knows? Who knows? Probably is a body of you. Don't fall asleep. Don't fall asleep. <laughs> you all right? I'm good. Good. Let's talk about some of the tropes in this movie. Now, I will say this came in, out in the late 70s. There were a lot of tropes going around that are kind of problematic. Oh, God, so many problematic. I... Highly emotional woman doesn't really contribute. Uh, terrifying situation leads to romance. Your friend has turned on you. Letter Nemo is actually evil. Don't trust anyone. Don't trust anyone. The government is lying to you. If you fall asleep, the monsters get you. Spas are disgusting and gross. I mean, that's not a trope as much as it is the truth. It depends on the spa. I don't trust any spas. You're not going to have fun on our cruise at all. No, I'm, I'm not going to visit the spas on the cruise. Otherwise, I'm going to have a great out. time. I'm probably going to visit a spa and I'm going to get a massage and it's going to be life changing because my back will finally stop hurting. Mm. One of the things I really liked about this, to take a quick break from the tropes, one of the things I really liked in regards to the cameo of Kevin McCarthy was that he said the lines from the first movie, they're coming, you're next. Yeah. And just completely, basically just completely reprised that role. Yeah, it, it could it could ostensibly just be a continuation of where his role left off. And I thought that was really cool, that it was a uh, a remake, but also kind of a su- like suggested sequel type of thing that a lot of remake sequels are doing nowadays. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. I I don't think every remake has to be a complete reto- uh, repticon. And you know, another thing that's great about this movie is the camera work. The The cinematography of this movie it's was beautiful. amazing. It's so many shots that just made you feel weird. There is the scene, yeah. particularly uh, the scene where Donald Sutherland is talking on the phone. Jeff Goldblum is trying to talk to him. And there's like a funhouse mirror behind them that's distorting them out of shape. And the focus is on the mirror. Similarly, very early on, there are a couple of characters having a conversation. And you don't see them. You see a hint of their reflection in a window. Yeah, that and that, like right out the gate to start off with a shot that disorienting. It's unsettling, and it's just so well used. It's really great. I will say, with the at the very beginning, we had the tropes of boyfriend is more interested in sports than girl. Oh, and doesn't care about her work. That's the one I couldn't think of. The you're gonna skip the game. You, you gave away your tickets to the game. I if I'm in, I might be incorrect on this, but I think that's literally the origin of the the day I give away tickets to blank. You know, I've been replaced. I think so. Yeah, that uh, I don't have any basis for that fact, but it is the earliest that I have seen it used. Well, that's the thing that tips her off, that makes her think that he's been replaced. So yeah, I think that's very accurate. Anything else you want to say about this movie? Oh, I uh, I forgot the original being based on. The McCarthy hearings. I actually have a little bit of a name drop, name dropper connection. To drop that name. Drop that name. Being from Buffalo, a way, a way back when, one of my very, very good friends uh, is a playwright in Buffalo and helped in the production of Manny Freed's play Boilermakers and Martinis, which was a one-man play about his life. And Manny Freed uh, was a playwright who refused to testify for the McCarthy hearings and was blacklisted. And uh, one of my one of the things that my very good friend John Elston ref- uh, likes to say uh, was that he has shaken the hand of the most dangerous man in America because that was what Manny Freed was labeled as at the time. That is in fantastic. Buffalo. That's so, super cool. Yes. It's a good name drop. It is a good name drop. Uh, Manny Freed, may he rest in peace, was a very wonderful, very neat guy. And uh, if I can steal the DVD of that show back from Elston... Uh, you should watch it because it's amazing. I would love to. Yes. Well, I think that's going to do it for our episode today. This has been uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers episode of Subverted Tropes. I've had a blast. I have too. You can find us on iTunes, Podbean, and Stitcher. You can also look us up on Twitter at Subverted Tropes. 
if you feel like sending us any emails, suggestions, or just feel like chatting, we are subvertedtropecast at gmail.com. Or you can look us up on uh, WordPress at Subverted Tropecast and just see our, our goings on and uh, whatever other junk we feel like putting online. That's right. We've got a couple of posts we need to do about the past couple of episodes we put up. But yeah, this is going to be some good stuff. We've got a few more movies coming up over the next couple of days. We're hoping to be able to record and get those posted. It should be a, a good time. So once October's done, I think we're going to get to not quite as many posts uh, throughout the the course of the month. I think Hopefully we'll, probably... we'll come up with some sort of regular schedule. I don't know. We'll figure it out. We'll figure it out. This is only our, what, fourth, fifth episode? Oh, no. You're the one editing them. Yeah, I think this is our fifth episode. So, okay. uh, yeah, we'll, we'll figure it out. Thanks for sticking with us while we're doing it. And uh, don't forget to subscribe to our channel, and uh, we will we'll love to have you. Like us, rate us, tell your friends. All that good stuff. Thank you very much, guys, and we'll see you next time.